everybody and welcome to Bratislava Hanus Days Online. It's been, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be our third event on our third day and let me assure you it's going better and better so hopefully you'll get a wonderful experience. Uh, before we start let me say a few words. Uh, BHD Online or rather Bratislava Hanus Days, uh, it's cultural academic festival focused on the encounter of Christianity and modern society. In its original form, it had to be postponed until autumn due to current situation, but this uh, is a result of our effort to bring you important discussions and inspiring speakers and guests. So we probably present uh, for the first time BHD Online. Uh, there is a free access to our festival for anyone, at the same time, we would greatly appreciate any financial, financial support from you. Please consider buying an online ticket on our website, bhd.sk. Thank you for your generous support, without which we couldn't organize this festival. Uh, speaking of organizing the festival, it is organized by Ladislav Hanus Fellowship. You can find more information on the fellowship itself or on any of its activities online www.slh.sk. Also responsible for the festival are our partners and sponsors. Uh, big thank you goes to uh, our main partner, which is Plout Company. Uh, besides BHD Online, Plout also provides complex software solutions to electronic identification and authentication using electronic ID and mobile devices. Uh, I would like to thank also our main media partner, conservative newspaper Postoy, as well as all of our other partners. Before we start and before I hand the word over to our host, Samuel Trizuliak, let me uh, mention two, uh, two things. The first one is that, that there will be two streams for the interpreted version of the discussion or of the lecture. Stay on our website, bhd.sk, and for the English original, please go to our YouTube channel, Hanus Sovedny. The second thing is that you can participate in the discussion using Slido, which is a tool or a rather website. You can go to slido.com and using the password BHD, you can uh, ask questions or upvote the questions that you like the most. And now let me hand the word over to our host, Samuel Trizuliak. And ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful time. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jay, for your uh, kind words of introduction uh, and welcoming everybody uh, as they tune in online to Bratislava Hanus Days. Uh, before I briefly will have the pleasure of introducing uh, our guest for the next talk, uh, let me just describe the, what is ahead of us. Uh, our esteemed guest will, uh, for about half an hour, uh, address us with his presentation on the topic which I will briefly describe. Then there will be some questions from my side, and then there will be also opportunity for you our followers uh, and online viewers to ask your questions through uh, the website uh, slido.com. You can find the details about how that works on our website. So now over to our topic and to our esteemed guest today. Um, our guest today is Professor Vincent de Meo, who currently serves as Associate Professor of New Testament at the International Theological Institute in Trumau in Austria. In the past, uh, Professor DeMio has taught at the Ave Maria University in Florida, Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio, and also here in Slovakia at the Collegium of Antona Neuwirta here in Bratislava. Currently at the International Theological Institute, he leads courses on biblical theology, patristics, and biblical foundations of marriage and family in theology. One of the many courses which he teaches at ITI currently is a course on the Apocalypse, on the Revelation. And he is with us here today online to address us specifically on this topic. Uh, in brief, we have called this topic of his presentation Apocalypse and Now, or uh, the Apocalypse Now. Uh, and the more formal uh, name for our topic today with Professor Vincent DeMio will be the core teaching of Revelation to John and its relevance for today. So welcome with us, uh, Vincent, uh, and I'll hand over the floor, this virtual floor, over to you. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's such an honor and pleasure to be with you today and to be with all of you, having this opportunity to reflect on the Apocalypse of John. So rich and such a, a great opportunity to do so. And the, the purpose of my lecture today is to highlight the core teaching of the Apocalypse to John, 
and also to highlight the relevance that it has for today, especially in the current uh, pandemic, current crisis. Now, I'd like to highlight three main elements uh, to the apocalypse of John. And the first one concerns the overarching question. The second one is the main answer that the prophecy that John receives puts forth to the question. And then lastly, the direct call of the apocalypse to you and I, to us Christians. So the first major element is the overarching question. And I think it goes something like this. Who is the Lord over the world? Where is God's kingdom? Is God and his saving action present in this suffering world? You know, the saints ask in Revelation 6, verse 9, they say, and they, they formulate the question so well. They say, how long, O Lord, before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So these questions concern the apparent non-fulfillment of God's promises to bring about, on the one hand, the judgment of evil, and on the other hand, to bring about the victory of the kingdom of God and to establish God's righteousness in the world. So to put simply, these questions are concerning the eschatological crisis regarding the relationship between good and evil. Now, the answer that the revelation of John gives us is from the transcendent perspective. It's from the perspective of God, from the heavenly perspective. And this is really important because the answer that John, that John sees in these visions is in God's terms. It's not, not in our terms. And, that, and that's, that's going to be absolutely vital. It's going to be key to unlocking the book of Revelation. Now, the quick answer, the short answer to these questions is that, yes, Jesus is coming. He is coming now, and he's coming in the future. God is acting now, and he's acting in the future through his only begotten son. Uh, I'll give you a great example of this. The very first vision John receives in chapter 1 of the Apocalypse is the glorious son of man. And after a detailed description of his character, we see exactly where he's standing. Where is he standing? In the midst of the church. And each of the seven letters that we read about in Revelations 2 and 3, again, where is Jesus standing? In the midst of the church. So the short answer is, yes, Jesus is not absent. God is not absent in our world. He's standing in our midst. Now, these questions are posed to us, or posed to John and, and to us, for the sake of building up our faith. And we, we could formulate them in some questions. Do we hope, I'm sorry, to build up our hope, our hope in God's activity. Do we hope in the many good things God will bring forth for us in the future? Do we place our hope now in our good father, in, our, in his hands that he'll, he'll be faithful to his promises? Will we patiently endure the difficult and challenging times that come our way for the sake of God fulfilling his promises, his covenant plan. And lastly, will we hope, will we entrust our lives into God's fatherly hands? So the central overarching question of the apocalypse is presented to us to build up our hope. Secondly, I'd like to highlight the main answer of the prophecy that John receives to these overarching questions. Now, the overarching, uh, the, the main answer is given as a prophecy. And we all know that prophecies are future oriented, aren't they? They predict the future. However, a lot of us don't know that prophecies are not only oriented to the future, but they are for the present. And again, that's so important. God was interested in, for the Christians in John's day, not only the, fu the, fu you know, the future, the Christians, the future of the Christians to come, Likewise, the Apocalypse of John is also not just looking at the end of time, but is also interested in our time today. Let's not forget that. Now, the, the core answer is that, yes, God is going to bring about his definitive new covenant, his marriage covenant between him and his people. And Revelation is so clear, so beautiful in this point. Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. 
For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Or verse 9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 21 depicts the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adored for her husband, the Lord. And then Revelation 21.3 says, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. That's the covenant formula that summarizes the entire plan of salvation, the entire divine economy. God is our God, and we are his people, bound in an intimate, familial covenant of love. Now, this new covenant, which is at the core message of the Revelation of John, at the heart of the prophecy, it's brought about in three ways. The first way is the victory of the definitive Davidic kingdom of God. Now, John sees an eschatological war of cosmic proportions between God and his, God and his Messiah on the one hand, and the forces of evil, Satan, his beasts, sin and death on the other. There's a war between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his love and his life, and the kingdom of Satan, which is a kingdom of sin and death. And John is witnessing the great climactic battle that's going to settle this war once and for all. Now, there are several things worth noting about this war. First, in light of the revelation that John receives, it's rather surprising that there's a war at all, isn't there? The prophecy is very clear that God himself is almighty. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who is and who was and who is to come. And he is in full control of his plan. Because God is almighty, the victory is already won. In addition, as the one who is, he, God is indeed very good. And he provides good things for all of his creation, such as the victory of the kingdom and this new marriage covenant. So then why is there a war? I think there's a war for two main reasons. First, God has granted us the gift of freedom, the gift of free will to choose him or not, to choose good or to do evil. And secondly, there's a war because God permits and allows evil to be done. Now, why has God given us free will, and why does God permit evil to be done? I think it's because so that we can choose him out of love, and, and also so that he can reveal himself to us and to reveal his love for us. But let's look at these things more closely. So what do we see at the heart of the, the Revelation of John? We see the Messianic War. This is Jesus' war, the War of the Messiah. And as John himself expected, as maybe you expect, what do we see? We see Jesus as the glorious Son of Man, foretold by the prophet Daniel, who is now establishing the, the, the everlasting kingdom of God. Furthermore, Revelation 5, 5 tells us that Jesus is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, and therefore the Messianic King, the new and greater David who is victorious over the forces of evil. And this too is expected. It's expected from the scriptures of Israel. However, there's something very unexpected in this war. John sees that Jesus is most of all victorious precisely as the Lamb of God who was slaughtered. Parenthetically, the word lamb, the lamb is predicated of Jesus 28 times in the book of Revelation, more than any other title he receives. It is, it is the seemingly weak, meek, insignificant lamb who conquers Satan and his beasts. Revelation 17, 14 states, the beast and his kings will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. What is emphasized in the, is this, is that the, the victory of the lamb who is slaughtered is not only that God is all-powerful, that he's also love. And the way God is victorious in battle is through his love. Now, the second way this new marriage covenant is going to be coming, coming to the fore in the future, now and in the future, is through an eschatological exodus. Now, how does King Jesus win the victory? 
Well, John sees that the victory is won through this eschatological exodus. The kingdom of God is victorious because Jesus, as the lamb who has been slaughtered, offered himself up, he offered his very own life as the definitive Passover sacrifice, precisely because he loves us with an immense love. Revelation 1, verses 5 through 6 tell us, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, be glory and dominion forever. Revelation 5, verse 9 states something similar. For you were slaughtered, and by your blood did you ransom men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So why is there a battle? Why does God permit evil? One reason is so that he, through his son Jesus, can reveal his love for us, just as he did so to the apostle John. Now, why is it that the sacrificial love of Jesus is able to defeat the kingdom of the devil, to defeat sin and death? It's because Jesus' love is equal to God's own love. It is revealed to John that not only is Jesus deemed the first and the last, as God himself is, but Jesus himself, as the Lamb of God, sits on the throne of God and is worshipped alongside of him. So it is because Jesus is God that his loving self-sacrifice is able to free us from our sins and enable us to share the life in the kingdom of God. The third major element that brings the new covenant is that through this eschatological exodus through, of the Lamb of God, through the, victorious, um, the victory of the kingdom of God, again by the Lamb of God, what is the result? a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation. Revelation 21.4 states, by the love of the lamb, what will occur? He will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. Through the sacrificial love of the lamb, we have the right to eat of the tree of life again and to live the life and the love of the triune God in the new Jerusalem. This is, again, nothing other than the new marriage covenant between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, his bride. The intimate, personal, familial union of Israel and all the nations with their God. I am your God, and you are my people. So this prophecy that John received, what what effect should it have on him? It should build up his faith. God is revealing this this core content to him for the sake of building up his belief, the sake that John may believe it, the sake of the the church to believe it, so that you and I may believe it. And so here we are with an existential question, will we believe this prophecy and and therefore hope, um, have hope in the future goods to come? Now, the last part, the last, the third main element that I want to highlight that I believe is at the core of the teaching of the book of Revelation, is its direct call, call to you and I, to call to all Christians. And the call is this. We are called to participate in the Lamb's victory through our own sacrificial liturgical witness. Now, there's a great Catholic biblical scholar in America named John Bergsma, and he wrote that the divine liturgy controls history. The divine liturgy controls history. Let me explain that by going through the the importance of a liturgy in the book of Revelation. The first thing we need to note is that the heavenly divine liturgy is absolutely central to the entire apocalypse that John receives. Central. John himself is receiving these visions on the Lord's Day, right in 110, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. This is probably Sunday. This is the day of the Lord, the day of his passion and death and his resurrection is commemorated. This is the day where they're celebrating Holy Mass. In addition, most of his visions are occurring in the throne room that's located in the temple, in the heavenly temple. And it is precisely here in the heavenly temple where God himself and the Lamb are worshipped. And what are the heavenly hosts doing? They are singing psalms, they're chanting hymns, 
Trumpets and harps are being played. Incense is being burned and offered. Lamps on lampstands are being lit. Angels and priests and elders are bowing and prostrating themselves before the Lord, praising and glorifying him, saying something very familiar. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So liturgy is absolutely central to the book, and it's the key to unlocking it. Secondly, it is clear that the divine liturgy is not directly about giving something to God or about changing his heart, but rather it is given for our sake to change our hearts from egoism to the love of God and the love of neighbor. Thirdly, when we change our heart and then offer our sacrificial worship to our God out of a devoted love, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to change the hearts of others for the better. One of the most profound, profound visions John was given was that all Christians are given a direct call to cooperate in ushering forth God's plan of salvation. God himself has ordained and allowed out of his merciful love to enable us to be co-workers with Jesus the Messiah in bringing the victory of the kingdom of God. Now, how precisely are we called to become co-workers with Christ in bringing this victory of the kingdom? Well, in general, we are called to imitate Christ's self-sacrificial love for his Father and all people for the sake of participating in it. Now, we can do this in two very concrete ways. The first thing, the first way, first concrete way is by going to Mass. When we go to Mass, going to Mass is nothing other than an earthly participation in the heavenly divine liturgy shared between God and his saints. By going to Holy Mass, we are called to imitate Christ by lifting up our hearts in love as a sacrifice of praise to God. As you, as we are also called in the Mass to participate in the heavenly sacrifice of the Lamb of God. This is what John is, was seeing, and this is what we're called to do at each and every Mass. Second of all, we are called to be co-workers with Christ in Christ's self-sacrificial love in another concrete way. It's by offering up our sufferings, our difficulties, our pains, our worries, our weaknesses, our doubts, especially in this time of crisis. We're, we're called to offer them up as a spiritual sacrifice of love to our God, as an alternative quasi-sacrificial liturgy. This is profoundly disclosed to John in Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11. Let me read it for you. When, the, when, de, when he, the writer, opened the fifth seal, I, John, saw under the altar the, soul, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Then they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete, were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now, these saints are followers and witnesses of the Lamb of God, who have imitated his loving sacrifice of himself. But notice that in, the, that in being told to, quote, rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete, it becomes clear that God's ultimate judgment upon evil is codependent upon the witness of the self-sacrificial of all Christians. Remarkable, isn't it? We have another text that says something similar. Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11 state this. And I, John, heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Messiah have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that is Satan, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they, the brethren, have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by their, the word of their testimony. 
for they loved not their lives even unto death. So similar to these Christian saints, you and I are called to be co-workers with Christ in offering our daily sufferings, difficulties, anxieties, pains, weaknesses, and worries to our God and for the good of all people, out of love. And that's the important thing here. Love is the important thing. Only love can forgive sins. Only love will overcome evil. By our sacrificial love united to Christ's sacrifice, we are bringing about the victory of the kingdom of God and of the Lamb. So how does the divine liturgy control history? It controls history because our participation in the sacrifice of the Mass, we, re we reveal to God, to Satan himself, and to the whole world over the one whom we truly love. As the Revelation of John makes crystal clear, it reveals the God to whom we have freely and voluntarily bound ourselves to in covenant. It reveals the one to whom we have given our entire life in all our loving devotion. In addition, the sacrificial liturgy of our own life is a witness to others, persuading them, convincing them, motivating them to also enter the kingdom of love with our good God. This is one of the main points of the Revelation to John. Christian witness, Christian martyrdom makes the issues clear. We believe that our God is the one true God who is saving the world through his son, Jesus the Messiah. And our participation in, this redemp in, in Jesus' redemptive sacrifice through our witness and our martyrdom has the main goal of the conversion of all Israel and of all the nations to God and in his kingdom. Again, there are several other texts that I could go on and on about in the, in the book of Revelation that make this main point. But again, to, to conclude, what is then the main revelation in the Apocalypse, what's the last word that John hears? It's love. Love has the last word. Why is there a war? Why is there a war at the center of the, the, the revelation? Why does God permit evil, sickness, death? Why does he permit the coronavirus? It's to build up our virtue of charity so that we may be united to him, our greatest and supreme good, in the eternal marriage covenant of the wedding of the Lamb. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vincent, very much uh, for your um, really rich and deep uh, exegesis that you offered for us uh, on, the, on the revelation to John and also on the exhortation to, uh, to build and to grow in the three theological virtues in, of, ch of charity, belief, and hope. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me start with uh, one or two questions uh, that, that kind of come to my mind first as I was listening to you. Um, one thing that struck me in particular uh, was when you spoke towards the end uh, on your third point about how we can become, so to speak, co-workers uh, in Christ's redemptive work. Uh, uh, and you mentioned that we can participate in Christ's redemptive, redemptive work, for example, by going to Mass or by offering our own sacrifices, uh, our own sufferings uh, as an offering uh, up to God. And I was thinking that's, that's very appealing and encouraging, but I'm also thinking whether that isn't perhaps a bit too strong way of putting it, that we are uh, co-workers in Christ's redemption. I mean, I understand this is probably a teaching of the church, but I'm just thinking of all my Protestant friends. Uh, if they heard me speak like this, they would be saying, oh, you see, this is the Catholics trying to, doing too much on their own, trying to go to mass and to work their way to heaven, and not just their own way to heaven, and even they are trying to work the way to heaven for their friends, rather than accepting that it's Jesus who, you know, holds the keys, so to speak. Uh, so I wonder if this is, if this isn't perhaps a bit too strong, or how do we, how do we, how do we prevent from seeing ourselves in these deeds uh, as being, you know, as substituting ourselves for Christ in doing the redemption? Thank you. Excellent question. Really, uh, such an important one today. Well, so several things. First and foremost, as Revelation 12 indicates, the text I read for you, let me read it again. 12.11 says this, and they, the brethren, so the Christians, have conquered him, so the accuser, the devil. How? Number one, by the blood of the lamb. And then, and by the word of their testimony. And because of their love, for they love not their lives even in the death. So as I indicated in, in the lecture today, 
the, the sacrifice of the lamb is center, takes center stage in the book of Revelation. You can't miss it. The, the lamb who was slain has defeated the kingdom of Satan by his sacrifice. And, and it's not as if uh, the lamb is, has you know, accomplished 60%, maybe so let's give him 80% of, of the victory. And then we have 20%. That's not what it is either. The, the lamb of God has defeated death has brought about the establishment of the kingdom of God completely, 100%, right? But one thing that, that the book of Revelation makes so clear is that Jesus, our good God, our good Lord Jesus, he wants to transform us. He wants to mold us through the, the furnace of suffering, the furnace of worries, the furnace of, of weakness, um, the first furnace of our difficulties and challenges that we're facing today. And, and he wants to say, love me first. Okay. You can love many other things, but love me first. And by our act of love, which imitates the love of our good Lord, this transforms our hearts. Um, but, but again, for the sake of participating in him, it's because we're imitating him and participating in him, that we're able to be transformed into him even further. So yes, yeah, so our, our God is the victor. The lamb is the victor, first and foremost, 100%. But God wants to transform us. And therefore, as a gift, this is a great gift, isn't it? It's a great gift. He's enabling us and granting us the gift to participate in his victory. And actively participate. Notice in the texts I read, the kingdom, it's, it's remarkable. I, even saying it, I, I, I'm humble. But the kingdom of God, the victory of the kingdom will not come in its fullness until you and I have loved our God with our whole heart above all things. And we've loved our neighbor as ourselves. Isn't that remarkable? It's stunning. It's striking. Um, but that's the call. That's the call, and that includes to offer up our, our daily sufferings that we experience as Christ bore his cross, as he bore the curse of Israel, as he suffered out of love for us. So it's true. It's a, it's a dramatic teaching, um, hard to swallow in a sense, but Revelation is clear. I mean, St. Paul says we make up, in, in Colossians, we make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, not because there's some deficiency, no. Christ has won the victory 100%. There's no deficiency. But the, the fact that out of God's mercy and love, he wants us to participate with him. This is this idea of bringing to fruition the fullness that, that Christ has won for us in time, in place, here and now, 2020, in our own lives, in our own communities. So many questions to ask. I mean, this is so fascinating. I mean... When you speak, speak, when you speak about the centrality of um, of the work of the lamb, uh, it's the lamb being slain who wins the battle over the, over the forces of evil and so on and, and so on and so forth. There is one thing that really strikes me in the imagery of the of the apocalypse of the Revelation. In one of the verses it says that uh, that the saints uh, in heaven their robes are white and they are white because they've been washed in the blood of the lamb. And as I was reading it today, I was thinking, well, if you Try to wash something in blood. Well, that's like the best way to get it dirty, rather. You know, if your if your white clothes is covered with blood, it's like one of the most difficult things really to wash. But um, that got me thinking that you know, when we speak about being washed by the blood of the lamb, it's really kind of working out in the so to speak in the in the in the God's reality, in the supernatural reality, um, and that that really caught my mind. And I was thinking. Uh, well, we partake, as you say, on that uh, by offering up our sacrifices. Uh, and one thing that you said is that the kind of the end point, the kind of when you take offering up our sacrifices or our sufferings, uh, kind of ad absurdum all the way to the end, it's being willing to be martyrs. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, how do we as Christians living in these relatively peaceful times, uh, you know, even now with the time of coronavirus, uh, Few of us are actually called to be out there on the front, like like the doctors. You know, most of us are staying at home, uh, not having to, so to speak, offer our lives. But but how can we, each one of us, uh, sitting at home with our families, you know, in our libraries, wherever, how can we cultivate this kind of openness 
to also that when the time comes, we may be even be willing and able to, you know, offer the highest, uh, the, the highest offer, so to speak. Thank you. Another great question. Um, say a few things, especially let's start with the, the imagery of being wa wa washed, uh, made white, or, or garments made white by the blood of the lamb. As you said, it, it's counter, the image is counterintuitive, isn't it? Um, however, what we're seeing here is that there's a certain purification going on, a certain cleansing, a catharsis that's taking place. And um, the, the, the washing of the white garments, washing them, washing them clean, in the book of Revelation seems to be connected to being sealed. And the church fathers, the church herself, the church fathers, see Thomas Aquinas and others, see in this washing and the seal, of course, the, the idea of baptism, the sacrament of baptism, and where we're washed and we're cleansed with water, aren't we? Uh, we're immersed. Um, but we're not only immersed into water, but as St. Paul clear, teaches so clearly, we, in our baptism, we are immersed into Christ's life, as it were. We actually die with him. We sacramentally, metaphysically, theologically really die with him. So to then really rise with him, in, of course, a kind of mystical, but, but real, again, sacramental way, um, so that we are made anew. We are made anew. So now, so, so that, there's that sacramental fact that we have all been made in new, this new creation, entering the new covenant, we participate in the marriage, um, covenant of the Lamb. And that, that's, you know, objectively speaking, right? We're, we're really participating in Christ sacramentally. But now there's another dimension. Um, and by the way, in, in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about that in the first half of chapter 6. And then, then there's, in the rest of chapter 6, there's this ethical or moral exhortation. And it's a bit surprising. You'd think, well, if we've died with Christ and risen for him, why do we need a moral exhortation, right? All is well. Well, yes, all is well on the one hand, but we still have to live our lives on another. We're still battling with our old self, with, with the, our, our sins and our vices. And so this is where um, the second half of your question comes in. Um, God has permitted evil. Um, to, in a way, bring good out of it, right? Um, he's, he's, he's permitting evil. It's, it's, he's not the cause of it, the indirect cause of it. But since it's there, he's bringing good out of it. And so when we face you know, economic crisis, when we face a pandemic, you know, a worldwide sickness, and, and uh, you know, death is staring us in our face, when we face great worries and anxieties, um, this is an opportunity for us to again offer them up it's it's to say well what are the main goods in my life right and is there a priority to these goods is there a hierarchy to them and the Revel revelation to john is saying god is the greatest good god is a good that above all goods the supreme good to whom i ought to order my entire life and in a way you know if i'm going to lose my wealth I'm going to lose um, uh, my health, or if I'm going to have great anxiety, it, 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 it's an opportunity for me to say, well, you know, these things are good, and there's a certain sadness that comes to losing them, but I, I offer them up, I sacrifice them so I can gain a greater good, God himself. And this is a real purification, isn't it? It's a real cleansing. It's a real catharsis, um, which is nothing other than an imitation of what Jesus himself did. Jesus gave up his life. Jesus went through terrible sufferings for us um, precisely to seek a greater good, which is God himself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, this is the Christian message, um, but this is also really a very strong message in Revelation to John. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just thinking to perhaps try to sum up your answer. So would you say that perhaps e even in the lives of the saints that we know who have ended up as martyrs, the way how they were able to, you know, to go beyond the line, to go all the way to the line in the end, was through practicing this kind of, let's call it sacrificial mindset of trying to offer up mm -hmm. small things and big things, but always uh, as the apocalypse urges us, as the revelation urges us to go out. Uh... Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And you said, well, to have certain, uh, you know, our, our life being cruciform, 
uh, um, a Christic uh, uh, cru cruciform key to our life leads to having a life that is, will be uh, molded by the resurrection. Um, but it, it starts in small ways, right? St. Therese comes to mind, her little way, doesn't it? Offering the, the little difficulties that we have, um, the daily difficulties we have. Um, and especially today with the, the corona pandemic, we have many opportunities um, to offer up uh, those, those things that are challenging us. Even, even the fact that we, we may be locked in our homes or something, right? Things are shut down. It's not the way I want it. Are we going to complain? Are we going to um, bemoan this, this, this circumstances? Or will we transform them, offer them as a sacrifice of praise to our God? Mm -hmm. um, it really is all, it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, it's all the difference. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. thinking also to kind of expand this theme a little bit more. It also relates to the way, uh, to describing the way in which we as Catholics understand prayer, right? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, we are often told uh, or we realize in our lives as Christians that when we pray, things don't always work out as we ask God to work out, you know. Uh, but through that, we learn that the divine economy, the kind of our discussion with God about what it means for us, as you say, to, to be co-dependent on the ultimate judgment of, we, well, to be co-workers in the ultimate judgment of God, which he brings about um, this kind of our interaction with our prayers. It's not always about having our way, but rather it's about kind of trying to tune in with God and living sacrificially. Uh, yeah, I guess Apocalypse probably uh, talks about prayer in this sense as well. Yeah, that's, that's another really good point. As I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, um, you and I have our own way, don't we? We, we, we could answer the questions that I posed at the beginning, the questions that the book of Revelation comes with. We have our own answer to that, right? But the, the revelation that John receives wipes away completely our own ideas and gives us God's plan. It gives us God's plan in God's terms. So I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples. Um, of course, we read a lot about judgment in the book of Revelation, don't we? And a lot of us are cheery. Yeah, they, you know, evil deserves to be judged. These people are evil. They deserve to be judged. Um, and they might, and they might, really so. However, there's, there's a few twists and turns, as we see in chapter six and chapter, yeah, chapter six and chapter eight, there are these great judgments. But then we see in chapter nine that God says, no, um, they have not, the people who have been judged have not repented. And then we're, we're, we're wondering, we're puzzled. Wait, wait, I, th I thought your judgments were to condemn them, Lord. No, it seems from chapter 9 that these judgments somehow were to bring about a repentance, a, a conversion of heart, a metanoia for these people. And it didn't work. So, so we're, we're a bit surprised. that God is, through these judgments, maybe this is a kind of mercy that he's offering people that have fallen into sin. And then... Um, at another episode, there's the great seventh seal is going to come where God is going to put forth his ultimate judgment of the world. And a lot of us might be cheering, you know, again, uh, down with the, the sinners. However, what happens in John 10? Uh, the angel comes with the seventh seal. John's about to write it down. And, and God says, do not write it down. Do not write it down, John. In fact, I'm not going to reveal the seventh seal now. In fact, I want you to take and eat the scroll. I want you to take and eat it, and then you have to prophesy again, John. And again, it's, it's to the reader, it's quite striking because we're, 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 we're thinking about judgment here, and all of a sudden, God is delaying. God is saying, let's put this judgment off. And now, John, take up your, your call to co-work with me and prophesy again for the sake of repentance, for the sake of koinonia, uh, uh, metanoia, mm -hmm. um, change of heart. So anyway, the whole idea is, yeah, this is God's plan, and it's happening in his terms. And so what we need to do first and foremost, which the Apocalypse of John is very clear, we need to fear God. We need to say, God, you are the mighty one. You are the one who loves us. This I know, and therefore I bow down in, in deference to you and to your ways. And I bow down in humility, ready to serve your ways out of love and to be this coworker. 
and to bring forth your kingdom as you want me to. And so this is a great prayer. Um, that, that's, that should really be the heart of our prayer, shouldn't it be? As we see in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Wins. Uh, let me shift a little bit from uh, this heavy and important theological discussion that we are having uh, to a more kind of contextual or historical question about about the way how the book of Revelation came about. Uh, and I was surprised to find, as I was reading some of the materials which you kindly sent to me uh, prior to your talk, um, that there has been some debate between academics in the past uh, as to whether the John to whom the, uh, the revelation is revealed is the John, the beloved uh, John the Apostle. Uh, and I know that on balance, the, the biblical scholars agree that it is indeed most likely uh, John the Apostle. But I was just wondering, uh, what is the strongest argument to the contrary? What is the strongest argument to perhaps suggest that it may not have been John, uh, uh, John the Apostle, who has actually been the person to whom uh, the revelation was revealed? If this argument is worth mentioning, I just found it interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's usual. It's usual um, arguments of uh, phraseology, of different terms, of different, yeah, different the way that the phrases are, are given, um, different theological interests, um, expansion of scope, um, literary style, things like that's the usual um, uh, culprits here. Um, and, you know, I, you know, we often want to categorize these biblical authors um, into a certain group or certain box. We want to put them in a certain box and say that their style is only this way, you know, that, that John wrote the Gospel of John, let's say, and he, he used these terms and these phrases and used this style, and that's his only one. And he can't go beyond that um, and uh, write in different ways to different audiences. And so um, I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt on that, that um, there are you know, many similarities of style and word usage and phraseology that we find, such as the word of God and the lamb of God, um, are, are prevalent, and, and the whole idea of, of the word, the spoken word, which is very important in the Gospel of John. Um, these, these themes are absolutely critical to, to the book of Revelation here, which are also to the Gospel of John and 1 and 2 John. Um, so there are a lot of reasons to hold that he's also the author. Um, it does mention his name explicitly, uh, I, John. Now, of course, you know, it doesn't say John the Apostle or John the one who wrote the Gospel, but there are questions that can be raised there. Um, but yeah, but uh, yeah, it doesn't, uh, shouldn't deter us as right. to the main message, of course, right. um, that we see. And, and it seems that there are good reasons why the tradition has held overwhelmingly that it was the John the Apostle uh, to whom uh, the revelation was, was disclosed. Let me ask a question uh, from Slido, from our online followers. Um, a guy called Boris is asking uh, this question. What would you say is the most appropriate interpretation of the prophecy of four horsemen in Apocalypse chapter 6? <laughs> yes. Yeah, now we're getting into the, uh, the infamous questions of, of the book of Revelation, of course. <laughs> yeah, which there are many. You know, uh, well, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people think that the book of Revelation is a certain secret code, right, for you know, the, the special Johannine community or, or the special Christian community that they're the only ones that could decipher this code. Perhaps it's it's a code that the Romans cannot decipher and the Christians can. But I'd like to counter that argument and say that, um, so that the argument basically holds that the, the revelation doesn't reveal, it actually conceals, right? And I'd like to say, no, the book of Revelation does reveal. <laughs> it really reveals. And if we notice, um, of course, there's a lot of symbolic language, highly symbolic language and visions, but at, at various points, um, the symbols that are used earlier are, are explained explicitly. So I'll give you an example. In Revelation 1, we read about the, the seven stars um, in the sky and the seven gold lampstands. And we're not so sure what these are. But then John tells us explicitly right at the end of chapter 1. And he says, now for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. 
So there you have um, symbolic language explicitly uh, explained in the, the book of Revelation, or even also in the first chapter. You have this account of the Son of Man, this glorious Son of Man appearing. Well, the Son of Man is no mystical figure, right? We have to go to the book of Daniel to see precisely who this is. There's a whole uh, Jewish tradition and text that reveal who the Son of Man is. So Je uh, Jesus' first vision to John is not cryptic. It's, it's explicit. It's for all, everyone to know and to read about. So anyway, go, to, to, to uh, go to the particular question at hand, we, we are even told who these horsemen are, at least to a certain degree, right? Um, the, the first horseman we have is, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, one of them, of course, is, is death in Hades. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, the uh, trying to find my text here. Yeah, well, anyway, I mean, even like these li living creatures that are that are referred to, um, they're, they're called by name, right? It's like the, the rider, so the fourth rider, verse eight, six, nine, six, eight. I saw and behold the pale horse, and its rider's name was Death in Hades. Followed him. So, so we have uh, some, some real clues of who these riders um, represented, these other beasts, these other animals. Um, the, the third living creature is holding a balance in his hand, the black horse, right? The one riding on the black horse. And he says, uh, um, he says to, uh, you know, for, he quotes, a quart of wheat for the denarius and three quarts of barley for the denarius, but do not harm oil and wine. You know, so here, this, this horse seems to be bringing some economic uh, strife and economic depression and economic um, failures. Um, so, so the fourth horse is bringing kind of death. It's kind of this climactic one, but the, each of the, of the four riders is explicitly mentioned to sim symbolize something. Symbolize some some great evil, of course. Um, so who now? Now a lot of people then want to say, well, uh, these four horses pertain to four historical figures, right? Four figures in history, you know. So so uh, you know Nero or uh, or Napoleon or um, or you know George Bush or or uh, you know Donald Trump. I don't know. You know. So they want to they want to pinpoint them to some historical figure. Where, where there, I think we're really misled. We're, miss, we're missing the main point of this revelation, which again is to build up our hope by saying that God's kingdom is victorious. And it's telling us how it's victorious by the, the sacrifice of love of the Lamb of God. And then the call to imitate and participate. Um, we don't want to lose that message with a sort of um, historical predication or, or lining up what's revealed here in symbolic language to historical circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of, of that way of interpreting sure. the text. Thank you. Um, the next question that I want to ask from, from our online viewers, uh, I will add a brief, I'll pose the question first and I'll add a brief commentary of my own. Uh, the most popular question as of now <laughs> is, uh, in some countries, people can get microchips implanted under the skin. Um, would you see this as a violation of human dignity? Could this be a mark of the beast foretold in the apocalypse? I guess now comes my commentary. This is perhaps one of the popular, controversial, perhaps uh, a bit superficial interpretations that people draw on the apocalypse. Uh, and I wonder what, I presume your answer will be rather skeptical about this. Maybe it'll surprise me. But I wonder more generally, the kind of book of apocalypse with its very rich imagery is always, I guess, and it has always been for history, very tempting for all kinds of superficial interpretations. Uh, so my question to you in context of this question would be, uh, how can we as Christians, you know, in our daily life, uh, live out the teachings of the apocalypse or what can we do on day to day basis so as to, so to speak, uh, soften this kind of creative and perhaps sometimes harmful superficial interpretations which are floating around? Uh, yeah, great, great, great question. And, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, the question of the horses and the, 
the, the judgments and the seals and, 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 and the, the number of the beast, these things are important. These things are very um, indicative of really important matters. Um, so I, let, let me present a certain hermeneutic key by which we could understand these things, such as the number of the beasts and the riders and, and um, you know, the, the, the plagues and all these other, um, the beasts, of course. And, and, and to, to address your question, Samuel, the way we could put it into perspective, so maybe to soften um, some very popular interpretations out there. Um, as I mentioned, the one major thing that Revelation to John is trying to propose to us is to reckon simply, I mean, it's so simple, it's so profound, to recognize God. To recognize God as God, so not as a figure of my imagination, not the God on, in, under my terms, but God as God. And so it's, it's interesting, um, in, in chapter 14, an angel comes into the scene to present the eternal gospel. And to receive the eternal gospel, we need to do two things. He says, fear God and give him glory. Fear God and give him glory. Now, there are several other, there's, now there, there are two other scenes that are similar. Another scene is where there's the kingdom of God. Um, well, uh, the saints are losing their lives for the sake of, of God, out of love for God. And um, people are seeing this. People are witnessing their sacrificial love. And what's happening? They, they Fear comes upon them. And guess what they do? They glorify God, right? So through our witness, through our sacrifices, through our Christian love, others will see, and, and, and hopefully what will come uh, within them, what will uh, come to pass within them, they'll fear God and they'll give glory to God. Last scene in heaven, at the end, in, in chapter 19, the heavenly hosts are praising God for the great victory um, in this liturgy. And guess what they're doing? Fearing God and giving him glory. Now, now, what is glory? What, what does it mean to glorify God? Glory, so anything that's glorious is something that's visible. Okay? At the very fundamental, it's something very visible. And, and because it's visible, it shines out, right? It, it, it's, it's filled with splendor and radiance. And now, but, but uh, that's not the full answer of what is glorious. You might say, say, well, what is precisely glorious? What shines forth? Well, it's the power that something has. It's, it's, in fact, the goodness that something has. Maybe the virtue, the excellence that something has. Then we might ask, well, why does it shine out? It, it, something glorious, the, the goodness or power, the good power of a thing, shines out so you and I can see it. We can recognize it. We can acknowledge it so that we may praise it and honor it. Okay, so God is glorious and revealing his glory in the Revelation of John so that we can see it. So John can see it. We can recognize it, acknowledge it, and praise him and honor him. Great. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, what is the big problem, right? What is the, the root problem of, of the beasts, of Satan, of the beasts, of sin itself? Um, it, it's revealed to us in chapter 17. Um, this is 17, where, uh, actually 18, chapter 18, verse 7, where it's discussing the great city of Babylon, right? This harlot city of Babylon, which is like the, the symbol symbolic epitome of evil, of sin. And 18, verse 17 says, she, Babylon, glorified herself. She, Babylon, glorified herself. What does that mean? I think the I'm also pulling this from the Gospel of John, but in the Gospel of John, we get a quasi-definition of the devil. The devil spoke out of his own. And John tells us in, in the Gospel that he who speaks out of his own seeks his own glory. So going back to Revelation, Babylon seeks its own glory, glorifies herself, meaning it's not looking at the glory of God, but it's looking at its own glory. It's looking at its own power. 
It's looking at its own goodness. I mean, not, well, not even goodness, really its own power, but of course, a vicious power, an evil power. But the point here is, is that instead of looking at the glory of God, the beasts, the devil, us sinners, when I sin, I look at the glory of man. I look at the glory of my man. I look at my, my own glory, my own power that I think is so brilliant and shining forth. And I, I and by doing that, I eclipse the, the splendor and radiance that coming from the, the glory of God. And that's really, that's not the, I think that's not the root of sin. So anyway, going back to the, the number of the beast, I think the number of the beast is precisely saying that. It, it's 666, right? It's the number, so it's the number before seven. Right. <laughs> There's a revelation. Um, but what's so important about seven that you see so prevalent in the, in the Revelation of John, you see it so prevalent in the book of Genesis, you see so prevalent at the building of the temple, all these different episodes. The number seven is the divine number, the number of God. Yes, it's the number of fullness, number of completion, but even more so. It's the number um, by which God... Um, sort of outlines history through his liturgy. If you notice, all these liturgical feasts of, of Israel are seven days. You have the seven day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where the first day is Passover. You have the seven day Feast of the Feast of Pentecost, seven day Feast of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement um, was offered, they have seven offerings. The, 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 the priest sprinkles the blood seven times. Anyway, you go on and on. But the, you know, the covenants are made by sort of sevening an oath is, is the same word for the word in seven in Hebrew, um, and, a, and an oath that you use to make a covenant. So all these, these important realities um, of God are connected to the word, the, the number seven. If seven relates to God, well, six refers to man. And so I think 666 is another symbol of the glory of man, the glory of man. One example of, uh, I think the only other example of 666 in the Bible is when Solomon, so this is one or two kings, when Solomon himself is is taxing the Israelites uh, something fierce. And they're falling again into economic problems, economic failures like ourselves. And and guess what? It's you know, 666,000. And perhaps there's a connection here that, and this is a problem that Solomon had, wasn't it? He himself is maybe focusing on his own glory, his own glory rather than the glory of God. We don't know for sure, but it could be a possibility. So anyway, addressing your question, Samuel, how can we soften maybe a, a, um, a very fantastic interpretation of 666 or, or of, the, of the idea of, of chips being placed within us? Um, I don't know. Could it be, could it be, could it be the, 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 the measuring line? Could the, 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 the criteria B, are these things occurring for the glory of God or for the, the glory of man? Now, of course, that's hard to discern, but that could be a starting point. That be, could be a starting point in our judgment to see if these things are for our good or for our, our, our ill. Um, and I think that's a major message here with the beasts and, and the, the 666. They're really seeking their own good, their own interests. Whereas we, us Christians, we're seeking the glory of God. And God is a good for all, isn't he? He's a common good. He's the greatest common good that's possible. He's the good for all. And so we love him not just for our own sake, but we love him at, precisely as a good for all. There's a huge difference in that than loving your own good, your own glory. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking uh, briefly about this uh... When talking about these more fantastic interpretations uh, of the apocalypse, I was reminded of the quote by J.K. Chesterton, who said uh, famously that uh, though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. Uh, so I wonder <laughs> that's perhaps a bit of, bit, bit, <laughs> bit of a yeah, jokey Excellent. way how to put what sometimes happens with the interpretation of the apocalypse. But thank you very much for your rich uh, advice theologically and, and pastorally how we can discern this, as you say, by looking whether this particle interpretation is towards working towards the glory of God or towards the glory of man. Uh, the particle one perhaps we're spreading this thought. Uh, let me ask uh, another question from, from Slido. Uh, and this is a question uh, by a lady called Mirka. 
and it's in Slovak. Uh, I will translate it uh, to English in a second. I will just use this moment to remind our followers and viewers online that they can ask their questions, they can continue asking their questions, both in English and in Slovak. I'll try to do my best to translate the ones in, in Slovak. So the question from Mirka is as follows. Uh, how do you, Professor Di Mio, look at the current situation in the church? Uh, isn't it perhaps already the, the, the fight, the battle of the final days, of the final times between the true church and new popular church, which is merely trying to pursue a dialogue with everyone, even at the cost of not following faithfully enough the teachings of Jesus Christ? Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea. You know, I don't know. Again, um, it's an ambitious if, question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's an ambitious question. And you know, of course, no, it's an excellent <laughs> one, of course. But um, yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, I'm wondering what, what am I called to do in all of this? Now, I'm, I'm called to be informed, right? I'm called to to not be in ignorance, but to be in in to be in the know, to come to knowledge. So we're reading and we're we're praying, we're discerning, and we're using our reason, right? We're also using our faith. And our faith is um, not eclipsing our reason, but it's fulfilling it, it's, it's building upon it, it's uh, perfecting it. And that's why we're studying the Apocalypse of John, aren't we? Right? We're really, we're trying to perfect our reason. And yeah, uh, I don't know. I, mean, I, I hope I'm not simply going back to the same old tune, but I think um, the difficulties that we're finding in the world, the difficulties we're finding in the church today um, are permitted by God, right? They're permitted. They're allowed. Now, um, again, we need to know about them, but we also need to respond, I think, in the only way possible is through love, is through love. You know, uh, Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3.19, he says something fascinating. It's one verse in the whole text, but again, it gives us key to understanding all the other difficulties that, that we find in the book of Revelation. He says, uh, 3 verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. Are we being reproved today? Are we being chastened? Are we being purified with a difficult time in the church? I mean, it's true. It's not an easy time. It is difficult, right? I mean, even with the whole lockdown of the churches, it's, it's, it's uh, astonishing in many ways. But perhaps I am being chastened. Perhaps this is a, a certain purification, a difficulty, a challenge by which God is revealing his love for me, for me to, to come to, not, to know something greater to maybe something to a greater degree and to love it more i'm thinking about the liturgy itself right you know we, we can't go to public mass these days and it's terrible but perhaps we're beginning an opportunity here i'm being given an opportunity through this difficulty not only to offer it up in general but to come to a greater understanding of what the mass is anyway and to come to a greater love for the mass and appreciation of it um I know I've, I've yeah I've, I've had these reflections in my own prayer life and and uh, you know studying even more what the mass is and because I have uh, more time to do it and I have I have more longing because I miss it mm -hmm. because I miss something so dear to me. Um, another thing is uh, in the Book of Revelation is fidelity, is fidelity. Be faithful. All right, right. So one of the questions that we posed in the beginning is God faithful? The prophecy of John says yes, He is more than you ever think. But then there's another question. Are you faithful? Am I faithful? Right? Do we believe this and do we hold on to it? And so we need to, so yes, I, I believe. I believe in this revelation John received. I believe in the revelation that Jesus has given to the Catholic Church and its offices. And I believe in them. And, I, and even though some of their ways may not be my ways, okay, um, that they're hard for me to understand and to even live with at times. Um, but yeah, I still believe in the offices that Jesus instituted and I hold on to them, not in blind faith, but precisely in faith that's informed by revelation, by the deposit of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I offer it up, I offer the difficulties up and this is going to bring forth the kingdom. It's going to bring forth the kingdom. Thank and you. so, you know, is, 
is the apocalypse now? <laughs> well, I know what is now. And now is, is love is now. Our call to love, to love the deposit of faith, to love the church, to love her institutions, to love her offices. We might not be so keen on who's in those offices or, or how those offices are being enacted, but we need to hold on to them and to love them even in through the difficulties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very, that's very, I guess, uh, a wise way of putting it. Uh, I'm just thinking there's this kind of paradox inherent to these questions about the apocalypse. Uh, often the apocalypse invites a very kind of fatalistic interpretation of whatever us as Christians are going through at any kind of point in history. And it's interesting how often we are tempted and we fall for the temptation to give in to these fatalistic interpretations rather than looking at the rich resources which the book of the Revelation offers, you know, and as you say, in exhorting us to be more charitable, more hopeful, and more believing. Uh, it's interesting how little we make of these kind of pastoral exhortations uh, for our day-to-day -day lives and how often we give in, uh, how often we give to the kind of fatalistic interpretations. Uh, but let me ask another question. And I was thinking with this question from Mirka about the current situation of the church. Uh, that uh, even if she may not agree or, she, well, she may or may not agree with uh, how you have responded with, uh, to the question, I was thinking she would certainly enjoy reading through a book of fiction uh, by a Catholic writer from Canada uh, called Michael O'Brien, who has written famously uh, two books, uh, very popular in many Catholic circles, called Father Elijah and the Apocalypse and Father Elijah in Jerusalem. I was wondering if you have read uh, Michael O'Brien's books, uh, and whether you're familiar with them, whether you could, whether you recommend them, uh, and if not, maybe, maybe not. I enjoyed reading through them, and I would perhaps recommend Mirka to read through those. But I was wondering if, if not, Michael O'Brien, um, do you have any other popular, or um, do you have any, any other not popular? That's not the right word. What are your other favorite works of art uh, themed with the topic of Revelation that you could perhaps recommend for us to to meditate in our own prayer life? Uh, yeah, no, excellent. So I highly recommend Michael O'Brien's works. All of them are excellent. And especially Father Elijah is really um, so, so rich and so deep and um, gives so much uh, fodder for, for thought and, and contemplation and, um, and for discussion. It's very provocative. Um, yeah, I also, of course, re recommend Scott Hahn's The Lamb's Supper. That's an excellent text. Um, his main point there is saying that the mass, the holy mass, as I was indicating in my talk, the holy mass is is the key that unlocks the book of Revelation, but but it also in reverse as well. The book of Revelation is the key to understanding the holy mass, and that is totally worthwhile, especially in these days where we're longing for um, to enter back into public worship, public uh, offering publicly the, the sacrifice of the mass. So I highly recommend his book. Um, another another really interesting read that I've read recently is. Vladimir Slovyov's The Antichrist. Um, it's short, but it's really sweet. I, it, it, uh, it really, using the, using the, the kind of the projection, the, the trajectory of the Revelation of John, um, he paints his own image of the end times. And it's sober, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's dramatic and it's a piece of literature, but it, it is a sober account where we really get a taste of the love of the love again, uh, I, mean, I don't want to give it away or anything, but, but uh, um, the sacrifices that are made. It, yeah. Anyway, the end is brought about by love, and it's, it's extraordinary. So that's another text I highly recommend. Um, another book that I recommend is by Michael Barber. He's a he's a really excellent Catholic biblical scholar in America. Good friend of Scott Hahn. He wrote um, a very popular but very readable and very rich book called Coming Soon. And he goes through all the, the interpretations that you can have of the book of Revelation and, and adds some really new, interesting insights as well, especially um, reading the book of Revelation through the lens of the Davidic kingdom that we read in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. He sees David as a real key to understanding the book of Revelation. Um, so those are three books I'd, I'd really like to... Do you perhaps have uh, any paintings in mind? I'm thinking, I'm sure there must have been some great painters to engage with the topic of the of the Revelation. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I do even um, have some of these great... Uh, um, yeah, Albrecht Dürer. 
um, D-U-R-E or, or Dower, perhaps. Albrecht Dower had these famous pictures of the apocalypse. You should go online, they're all online. And there are these, these drawn illustrations of many, many visions of John. And they are just absolutely uh, stunning. And what, what detail. And, and the fact that he even mi mixes some imagery. So you really look at them carefully because he's trying to tell basically the entire book of Revelation in pictures, in, in art. So they're really worthwhile um, looking, looking at. Thank you, thank you. I'm thinking about one other question uh, coming back to, to some of our misconceptions perhaps about the apocalypse. I'm thinking um, often, we, often we think about or we tend to reduce the apocalypse uh, uh, to thinking or the, the book of Revelation to thinking about what will happen in the end about the kind of eschatological, that's the right word, isn't it? About the things of the, about the final things, right? And it certainly does cover those things. It does speak about the second coming uh, and the world to come. But as you have spoken throughout your presentation as well, uh, the apocalypse also talks about the world as it is now, right? Uh, so I'm kind of wondering where's the right balance between, uh, between looking and into the book of Revelation and, and accepting it as something which tells us about the things to come, but also perhaps uh, also accepting the ways in which it tells us about, you know, the already ongoing and present battle between good and evil, which is happening out there, you know, in the, in the transcendent, in the supernatural realm. Uh. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm so glad you see, you see that, that, as you re referred to earlier, that um, there are so many fatalistic interpretations of the apocalypse, right? That, you know, it's kind of a, um, a static, book, right? It's, it's not dynamic, it's static, it's it, everything, it's in a way passive, it has a sort of passive nature to it. That is really false. As, as I've been trying to um, articulate today, it is highly dynamic, highly active. Not, not only, it does present the end, right? I mean, John receives the vision of the end, right? This heavenly liturgy by which um, Israel, the nations are united in the new covenant, the marriage covenant of the Lamb, where they have the right to eat of the tree of life again. So there is the the vision of the end is clear. And, and of course, that includes the, the definitive battle where the kingdom of Satan is destroyed. The kingdom of sin is destroyed. The kingdom of death is destroyed. So that is certain, right? The victory has been won. But then also there is, is this great dynamism and activity and this great call that you and I have from this prophecy that we are to participate. In fact, the end will not come without our participation. Is that remarkable? Absolutely remarkable. So yeah, so it's dynamic. Now, um, to more directly answer your question, um, yeah, um, can you repeat your question one more time? Yes, I, I was wondering about the, the kind of paradox or between two interpretations of the apocalypse. One is that, of course, it speaks about the final things, you know, the things to come, about oh, yes, the final yes, days, yes, the second coming. You. But yes. also, in a way, it describes, uh, well, it also, and, and it describes the final things, you know, as, as a final point in, in our linear history, uh, if which we as, you know, humankind are a part of. But it also describes, uh, you know, the ongoing battle, uh, kind of between good and evil, which is already yes. happening in the, both now in the linear time in our point, so to speak, right now. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, let's come at it two ways. So, so scholars often talk about maybe the Gospel of John or other biblical text about realized eschatology. So as we know, eschatology is the study of the last things, right? Um, death, judgment, heaven and hell. So the last things. And the, the, the apocalypse of John is very much about that. But they also talk about a realized eschatology, where, um, for instance, in the Gospel of John, um, John says, whoever believes has eternal life. Well, he doesn't predicate when exactly do you have eternal life. So it's, it, and from other texts in the Gospel of John is, um, you who believe now receive eternal life. So this idea of realized eschatology that because you believe, yes, you will have eternal life in the kingdom of God to come but you also have eternal life now. And that's also in the book of Revelation. You, through your sacrifice of love, through you imitating the Lamb of God's sacrifice, 
you will not only participate in the kingdom to come, but you participate right now in the kingdom. So again, scholars see this idea of realized eschatology, which, which is um, articulated very nicely in the catchphrase, already, um, now, what is it? Uh, already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. And I think that's how we should live our lives. We are living eternal life now already, but there's a dimension that's not yet, that hasn't fully come. I'll give you an example of the Eucharist, right? The Eucharist is Jesus Christ's body and blood, soul and divinity. He's substantially present. He's really present to us, isn't he? Um, so it's already, we, we already behold our Lord and Savior in the Eucharist. However, um, as the Catechism teaches, as the, our faith teaches us, the Eucharist is a pledge for future glory. There's a future orientation of the Eucharist as well, when we will also behold him, really, substantially, truly, but not in the form of bread and wine, not through the species of bread and wine any longer. We'll see him face to face. So in the Eucharist, there's an already, but there's also a not yet. And the already doesn't, uh, the not yet doesn't imply anything deficient. Mm -hmm. It just implies something different, that we see Jesus, we behold his real substantial presence in the form of bread and wine, but then the, the not yet, we will see him face to face. So it's a different mode by which we'll behold him. And all the sacraments are like that. And in fact, our life, our, our pilgrimage here on earth as Catholics is like that. It's an already not yet. And I, and I think the Revelation of John substantiates that, it supports that, confirms that, that great road that we could already rejoice now for the victories won, yet you and I have to roll up our sleeves and do a lot of hard lifting, heavy lifting, and hard work mm -hmm. to bring forth the kingdom um, by loving our neighbor and our God with all our hearts above everything else that, uh, that we love and seek. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer also, highlighting the, the centrality of the Eucharist and how it is you know, important and how it flows out our understanding of the Eucharist from the book of the Revelation. I'm both overwhelmed and amazed as a Catholic uh, how interconnected all of these themes are in our faith uh, and how we can always go one step deeper uh, in our understanding of it. Uh, we have time for two more questions. I will ask one last question from Slido and then I'll have a question of my own uh, for the end. We are slowly but surely running out of time, so if we can cut the, if we can do the responses kind of shorter, perhaps yes. so that we stick to the times. Um, so uh, a guy called Richard, uh, Richard is asking, as it relates to the Eucharist and to the Holy Mass, uh, the following question. Um, John describes in the apparition the heavenly Mass. Uh, some believe that the old Mass, in its extraordinary form, better imitates the description by John uh, than the Novus Ordo does. Uh, would you agree with that statement? They both articulate the vision, uh, the heavenly vision of the liturgy in, in two wonderful ways, don't they, right? Um, you know, another thing about our faith, um, exemplified in the great theologians, especially St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, is that Catholicism is a both and faith. The faith, an et et, to use the language, right? They use the Latin language, both and. Um, yeah, Catholicism holds, yeah, Christ has, has won it all, has saved us all, 100%, and we participate in him, right? Um, we need to believe in Jesus as, as a son of God, Messiah of Israel, and we need to love him, faith and works, both and, constantly, down the list of what we need to believe. Um, the same thing you think you see in exegesis as well. Uh, for the last 200, 300 years, um, it's been so common, terribly common, in biblical exegesis to have what people now call an either-or exegesis. That the revelation, the book of Revelation, has to be interpreted either this way or that way, but we can't reconcile either of them together, right? Kind of contradict each other. Um, however, the, the, the patristic great saints, the, the saints of our church, the doctors of our church, um, again, exemplified by the, the, the fathers of the church and St. Thomas Aquinas and others, they, the way they understood scripture, for instance, was again, both and. If you read uh, how St. Thomas Aquinas you know, uh, interprets the Gospel of John, he's going to juxtapose St. John Chrysostom's interpretation, St. Augustine's, and then he'll have his own. And you know what? He's going to hold them all together. 
Um, not, not because that's easy. In fact, that's even harder to do than just say either or, right? Just to pick one. It's even harder to reconcile different accounts and, and you're seeing then therefore the richness of the biblical word. So anyway, what I want to say very briefly is that I think we ought to also have this et et disposition, which I think is a Catholic disp disposition of both and, not either or, but of both and. So I, I love the Norris Ordo. I love the extraordinary form. Both articulate the revelation of John in their own way, in a wonderful way. And let's have both. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. I think it's very refreshing to be reminded of the of the fact that the et et mindset is truly the Catholic mindset in a time when the stereotype, which many people like to say about Catholics or us as Christians, is, the, is that we are somehow restricting our thought and our practice and so on and so forth. I think rather there is much richness to be found and inclusiveness in, in the Catholic faith. One last final question, and I would uh, like to, uh, that I would like to pose is, is this, uh, we are slowly but surely, it seems, coming to the end of the corona crisis. You know, some governments in Central Europe and in Europe maybe even in the United States slowly, are thinking about um, stopping some of the quarantine measures. Um, this has been an interesting time for us as Christians, for us as church. Um, and I was wondering kind of if you could offer perhaps two or three sentences towards the end or some of your final thoughts uh, as to what could the apocalypse tell us as we move from this kind of time of quarantine, perhaps back to functioning more normally in our work uh, and in our family lives and so on and so forth. So some final words in this respect from uh, from you yeah, two things um again jesus says in, in verse chapter 3 verse 19 those whom i love i reprove and chasten um we don't seek out suffering but when it comes our way offer it up as a sacrifice of love as christ offered his suffering and death as a sacrifice of love that is the way that's the christian way it's the way towards the kingdom and as things might be lifting as things might be getting easier um, please remember this. I just read an article by Peter Kreef that was that said, he had a beautiful line. He said, religion, I think Christianity's most successful enemies are its successes. Christianity's most successful enemies are successes. So we have to be careful of the comfortable life. We have to be careful of, of the easy road. And perhaps that's why God permits uh, evils and, um, and sufferings. But again, let's transform those sufferings into love. Yeah, thank you for those uh, encouraging words for the end. Well, Winston, it has been a great pleasure to be able to have this discussion with you uh, mm -hmm. today online. Thank you for coming and joining us uh, virtually yeah. in these Hannes days. And we hope we will be able to meet you perhaps in person in the future uh, when, when things get back to normal truly. So thank you once again for tuning in. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure and honor. So take care. and Thank uh, you for your good work. Uh, have a lovely evening back in back in Trumau in Austria. See you, thank you. in the thank future. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me also thank our dear guest, our host, and especially let me thank you, dear viewers, for tuning in, for watching this discussion, staying with us. And please do that as we are slowly but surely coming to a uh, final discussion of uh, BHD Online. Uh, and it's going to be about coronavirus, uh, some of the finest Christian intellectuals will be discussing the coronavirus current state of, of the world and its impact uh, on church, politics, society, and so on. So stay tuned. Um, the video of the uh, discussion or lecture that have just ended uh, is being uploaded on our YouTube channel as we speak. So you can find it there and you can maybe share it with your friends, watch it later whatever you want. Uh, there are going to be, or at, actually they are, uh, other videos from our previous festivals, so you can, you can use it and there is plenty of uh, watching material for you for the uh, following days. Uh, SLH, I mean uh, Ladislav Hanus Fellowship, the organizer of the, of the event and of the festival is uh, inviting you to join uh, its academic academic program that is being launched in September. Uh, there is one version for those based in Bratislava and there is other version of the program for those based anywhere else as it's going to be an online course. Uh, you can find more information about it on our website slh.sk. Uh, let me thank once again our partners and sponsors, the main one being company Plout. Thank you very much. Uh, the main media partner 
is a conservative uh, newspaper Postoy, and we would like to thank all of our other partners and sponsors. Uh, if you enjoyed the discussion, if you enjoyed the festival, feel free to contribute to support us financially. One easy way how to do it is to go on, a, on our website and to click the button Podportenas or scan the QR code or transfer your contribution uh, via the bank account. You, can, you should see the bank account number on your screen right now. Uh, as I said, we are slowly moving towards the final discussion. Uh, we are going to start in about 30 minutes. Uh, some say it's going to be one of the highlights of the festival. So I kindly invite you to tune in or stay tuned. Uh, we will see each other in around 40 minutes. Take care.